This Week in Startups is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn has marketing tools to help you target your customers with precision. For a free $100 LinkedIn ad credit to launch your first campaign, go to linkedin.com slash thisweekinstartups. And Walker Corporate Law, specializing in the representation of entrepreneurs. Visit walkercorporatelaw.com. Hey, everybody, it's Jason Calacanis, and I'm sitting here in an absurdly expensive apartment in San Francisco. Now, this two-bedroom goes for $2,600, but I'm sitting here with a special founder who has created an amazing technology that allows this one-bedroom to become a two-bedroom. His name is Sunkarshan. Did I get, pronounce your name correctly? It's Sunkarshan. Sunkarshan. Yeah. Sun Karshan. I think I got it. Um, welcome to This Week in Startups. Thanks for uh, taking me to this interesting apartment. This is a looks like a living room slash office. Yeah, you walk in. It looks like a living room. Uh, there's a coffee table. There's a projector. You can hang out, uh, entertain your friends. There's a study area. Uh, so All of can... this for $2,600, but right. no bed. Well, there is the bed, except okay. we're now using volumetric space for, uh, for the bed. So, so where's the bed? The bed is in the ceiling. So and, show me. Uh, yeah. So here's how, here's how the bedroom works. So we call the bed down. There is a uh, control panel over here. And okay. So for those of you listening, I'm going to step out of the way so I don't get in the way of a bed dropping from the ceiling. And what you're hearing is some pulleys system of some type. Uh, and voila, in a matter of what seems like about 20 seconds, we now have a bed on the floor of this uh, apartment. Yeah. And then there's also a nightstand. Okay. Well, let's wait for that. Uh, let's go over the bed for a second before you jump the gun. Sure. Um, or drop the nightstand. Yeah. <laughs> so here's your nightstand dropping down very fast. So let's talk about what we see up here. Um, I'm yep. looking at a pulley system for those people who are listening that looks like bands. They're kind of like the bands I would use um, when I'm tying something to the roof of my car. Right. Very, it's very strong yeah. bands. Yeah. And they go up. There's obviously four around the four bed posts or what would be the bed posts and uh, some kind of pulley system here. Explain to us what we're looking at. Right. So basically this is a, a hoist. Uh, you know, normally industrial hoists are these steel cable, loud, ugly uh, uh, things that, that are used in automated storage and retrieval systems, right? Like in warehouses to take, take, thing, take things up and down. But what we've kind of developed is a much more home-friendly version of it where you can do like a smooth start, smooth stop. Uh, it's quiet uh, and it's got, uh, you know, seatbelt kind of material almost. Ah, seatbelt, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it's still friendly to touch. It's not like a steel cable. Uh, you can run into it, and uh, it won't it won't hurt you. And then, but it's also uh, has a really high um, uh, infinite amount of cycles it can do in a very high load situation. So something like three kilo newtons, you can infinitely cycle within that load, uh, and nothing happens to this. So, uh, and then it's also safe. Uh, so it's redundantly safe. Just mechanically, it self locks. Uh, it's okay. It, hold on a second here. Yeah. You use the word hoist. Not a pulley. No. So explain to the audience, what is the technical difference between a hoist and a pulley? So, yeah. Because so, I would have called it a pulley or something. What, what, what is the difference between a hoist and a pulley? A, a pulley a pulley is essentially, uh, I mean, there are, for example, the load, uh, the load cells on the edges. So there's, there are bearing systems. Essentially work like a pulley. So pulley is part of the system, but the hoist itself is... Uh, uh, in, 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 the, in industrial uh, warehousing and industrial uh, lift mechanisms, a hoist system is something that uh, redundantly safe. So just mechanically, it self-locks. And, uh, and it, you cannot pull it down, like, no matter what. So the more load you put on it, the more it self-locks. It, ah, a, so a hoist will self-lock. So self -lock. if the kids try to pull on these yeah. uh, four different, what do you call these bands? Webbings. The webbings. Yeah. If your kids started pulling on the webbings, it's not going to pull down the hoist and the whole rigging system. Absolutely not, yeah. Right. And um, when it's going up, it has this like, or when it's coming down, it starts slow and then goes a little bit faster. Explain that motion. And right. And when you're explaining it, why don't we go ahead and have the bed come up now. Sure, yeah. And we'll look at uh, this little speed delay because obviously things going up and down in an apartment 
uh, is kind of scary for people. They've never seen this before. Yeah, yeah, it's a new way to live. I mean, that's what Bumblebee offers. It's instead of uh, everything being stationary, sitting on the floor, acting due to gravity, you know, every function now uh, gets added in uh, two dimensions versus we're unlocking the third dimension in Got the it. ceiling. And so it went very slow to start. Right. Now, is that because it just wants to give you an idea that it's going to be going up and doesn't want you to trip over it? So there is that UX element, but there's also some of the sensors are initializing to see if there is additional overweight situation or overstuffed situation that, it. that it's not allowed to. Now, if my eight-year-old were to go on the bed with her friends and say, put me in the ceiling, right? that's obviously the first thing a kid's going to try to do. So if right. a 40-pound kid jumps on the bed yeah. and then hits the button, what happens? So does, we, does it we, put the kid up in the uh, ceiling? Right. No, it won't because we have load cells measuring load on every webbing. Okay. Uh, so as it goes up the webbing sees whether or not uh, you know, there's additional weight than what uh, the mattress for, plus the bedding is uh, allowed. Yeah. And any, anything more, it'll just wait. Okay, so I see here closet. Mm -hmm. uh, if, and if I want to have the closet drop down here, what do I do? Just, I just press just it? Just press and hold. First. Press and hold. Yeah, that's it, let go. Okay, so I pressed it, I held it, it turned red, and here comes my closet coming down, zip, zip, zip. Um, and Again, you have the pulley system up there. Yeah. It looks like it's a smaller frame, but it still has the four belts. Exactly. It's the same, it's the same robotic uh, modules, uh, mm. you know, the same sensor, same motor control, same uh, electromechanical system that repeats in various frames. Got it. Uh, and the way we kind of do it, the bed is slower and the rest of the units are faster. Uh, and we draw the same amount of power for every drop or uh, ascend. And so for me to put the closet back up, I just press the button, is press that it? Press and hold. Press and hold. Yeah, that's it, let go. And when it turns red, I let go, and that yep. goes up really fast. Yeah. Now, if you were to stand underneath that, and I press the button, what would happen? So you can try it with the, with the bed, if you try to lower the bed now. Okay, so you're, you believe in your product so <laughs> much that you'll stand under, what is, what is that, 300 pound bed, 400 pound bed? Uh, yeah, it's like 265. 265 pounds, here we go. <laughs> it was great having you on the show, buddy. I'm gonna lower the bed. Do not blame me, you yep, asked me to do it. That's uh -oh. it. it. It flashed the lights. Flashed the lights. And, and I got a message here that says, safety alert. Object detected under the lowering unit. Cancel, lower anyway, or try again. <laughs> you, can, you can lower anyway or try again. So lower anyway, uh, so if there's occlusions or some like known issues with the sensor which is causing so that's kind of a beta version of it at right. the moment so if you it, we've gone extra uh, like conservative safe so it, when when there is issues with the safety sensor uh it tends to just not come down got it so you can lower anyways like an override to the got system it. so you have to figure out ux wise if you should even have that button right because it could be dangerous if kids want to play. They're gonna the first thing kids are gonna want to do exactly. is drop this on each other's head. Exactly. And if it was if we did the override and it hit you, would it stop? Would it know there was something under it? Or would it just keep going? Uh, so if you lower anyway and it comes down, we can use the motor torque and load cells and other sensors ah, to start. Got yeah. it. So if you put your hand up and I start lowering it, right. it would know something was exactly. wrong. Exactly. So as soon got as it. it feels something, yeah. But I we're not going to test that. We're not going to test that. Yeah, now. that doesn't sound like it. So this is the first time you've had this installed in a commercial space. Uh, yeah, this is this is the first one that's open to actually like the market, like open for renting. Got it. Uh, we've done one model home install, which is uh, which is kind of in a closed uh, location. But yeah, this is kind of the first one out in the real world. Has somebody rented it yet? This has been rented. Yeah. So what would this unit normally go for? Uh, normally, these uh, the units with the bay windows go between twenty one, twenty two hundred. Got it. And this one is going for twenty six hundred. So they get an extra four or five hundred dollars per month, an That's extra right. five thousand dollars a year, right, for having this built in, right. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong. If the person has this, they don't have to buy a bed, or yeah. a nightstand, or an armoire. Right. They don't have to buy the floor furniture or the ceiling furniture. So we kind of optimize both. Got it. So if you think about it, just for saving money on the uh, furniture, yeah. it's kind of a break even. Right. Maybe. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, the way uh, as far as the resident should think about is, you know, what would it cost to rent a suite if mm. you need a, a living room and a bedroom? Right. And so you're now like, instead of having double uh, two compartments and 
occupying multiple square footage, you're now getting all the functionality within this. This week, I have spent at least 10 hours cleaning up legal messes at startups I'm investing in. In one case, the founders didn't have vesting schedules and one of the founders left the company. So now this 40% of the company is owned by a founder who doesn't even work there and only worked there for six months. In other cases, people use the wrong corporate structure. They were LLCs, which then prevents them from ever getting venture capital. In other cases, they were registered in a foreign country and couldn't get investors in America. In other cases, they didn't even have non-disclosures and non-solicitation. So an employee left one of my startups and took three people with them because they didn't have a non-solicitation. All of these legal errors would have easily been caught by my friend Scott Walker at the Walker Corporate Law Group. They are a boutique law firm, and you've heard me talk about the Walker Corporate Law Group here on This Week in Startups many times. Well, they are focused on entrepreneurs and startups only. This is what they do at Walker Corporate Law, and they encouraged fixed fees. In other words, they tell you what they're going to charge you for a service. So you don't have to sit there with that anxiety waiting to open that PDF and seeing some huge bill. Nope. You know up front what it's going to cost to do those mergers and acquisitions, licensing agreements, start your company, employee stock option plans, terms of service, privacy policies, all these things have to be done right. And they will cost 10 times as much to fix because I'm literally doing that. Before I invest in a company, I give them a list. You have to fix the vesting schedule. You've got to get the company incorporated properly. You've got to get the IP assignment done. I'm literally doing cleanup work that Scott Walker would have solved for these companies had they used him as their attorney. So give him a call, 415-979-9998. You've heard me say that number before, 415-979-9998. Or email Scott directly, scott at walkercorporatelaw.com, scott at walkercorporatelaw.com, or visit walkercorporatelaw.com. You really have to get focused on these things. Have the right corporate structure, have the right cap table, have the right vesting schedule, IP assignments. If your company's worth doing, it's worth doing correctly. Get your legal stuff dialed in so that you don't have red flags popping up. And we literally had a meeting before uh, this podcast where I was sitting with one of my people who went through some diligence and there were like seven issues that needed to be fixed. And we got to the end and said, you know what? Is this a sign that the CEO doesn't know what they're doing? Is this too many red flags for us to invest? Well, I'm telling you candidly, if you have too many of these red flags come up during due diligence, you could lose quality investors. So go talk to Scott Walker. He's a great guy. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Okay, so let's talk about the mechanics here and installing it. Yeah. Um, It looks like a grid system has been put into the ceiling. So you're connecting it to the studs, I guess? Right. Yeah. So every 16 inches, there is a ceiling joist that's running uh, along, along this plane. Uh, and all, all ceilings have this joist that, that is part of the building code. Uh, and what we do is we anchor our uh, railing system uh, into the joist, mm. and then the robots slide into the rails. Got it. How long does it take to install a bedroom like this, which looks like it has about, I don't know, five, six components? Yeah, these are six modules. This one took us close to four hours, but our target at scale is to do it under an hour deployment. Really? Yep. So under a half day. Yeah. Uh, and when I look at this unit up here, I see it's not covered, and I see, an, I guess, what is it? it looks like a motor of some type, and then a circuit board. Is that an Arduino or something? Or uh, So there is a motor control. Uh, we, have, yeah. uh, we have a couple computers there. One, uh, there's a... Uh, there's a Raspberry Pi, and then there's also an upboard. Uh, so there's a couple computers there, uh, but they're all. What doing are those computers edge- doing? Because yeah. uh, up lowering and pulling up the pulley system, the hoist that right. doesn't take a computer. Uh, so or does uh, it? Very low level computing in the motor control, which controls the motor uh, speed torque profile. Yeah and understands... Uh, but you don't need the know, Raspberry Pi for that. You don't need a Raspberry Pi so what, for that. So what is all that other technology up there for? Right. So uh, so it's all kind of uh, related to the, uh, the safety and the user experience. So one, we want to understand the user has given the command, it's safe to lower or safe to proceed or safe to raise. You know, How so, does it know it's safe? Uh, so there are these sensors. Ah, what are those? Those are safety sensors looking at like a 
3D space, you know, like uh, looking at the whole grid. Got uh, it. So those, uh, just for those people listening, it looks like a Wi-Fi router with two sticks with two cameras. Who right. makes that? What is that? What kind of technology is that? Right. So is it uh, LiDAR or what is it? Yeah. So there, it's laser-based uh, time-of-flight sensors. And we actually, so we took, we took an off-the-shelf sensor, uh, plus we built our own firmware to kind of stitch together a whole 3D space. So they're lasers yeah. that create a 3D space. Yeah, they, they look at the whole 3D space and any So that's how it knows if there's something underneath it. Right, and oh. only metadata is going from that to the controller. Right, it's not a camera system it's where you're videotaping camera. what happens in the room. Right. It's not even capable of doing that. That's right, it's only looking at it's not even looking at shadows or anything, right? right. It's only looking at metadata like object detected, occlusion detected, a safety it. issue. You know, those are the Got only it. things that are moving back. Yeah, and I forth. guess it would be a little spooky to have four cameras on your bed like that <laughs> right. for most people. That's right. Um, so that technology is the same technology that they use at Waymo or other self-driving cars, uh, it's, but on a yeah, smaller this is scale. For a, uh, this is for indoor applications. Uh, the ones that they use in like on top of the Waymo, the bucket, uh, the Velodyne laser, that one. Uh, that can like do 50 meters or you know Go tens of meters, yeah. yeah. And uh, they need that because the cars are moving that sure. that fast. Yeah, here you have a fixed amount of space, of exactly like eight by ten room or something. Exactly. So we we experimented with much lower level systems also, uh, but this one gave us a little bit more uh, reach and you know. Um, so this this has been working really well for us. And uh, will you cover all that? stuff up yes. eventually and make it look neat absolutely yeah. we're going through a full industrial and interaction design spin got it it'll look like artwork it'll look like apple product in the ceiling it won't right. look like 80 20 and circuit boards got it uh and so what will this eventually cost if i want to buy it actually you know what hold that thought when we get back from this commercial break we're going to talk about the economics of what, what do you call this system uh we're calling it the bumblebee robotic system Bumblebee robotic system. Okay, it needs a little bit of work. Yeah. <laughs> I like the name Bumblebee. Why Bumblebee? Is there some? Uh, so bees are very efficient in how they manage space, uh, and they're also a really interesting species. You know, they. Yeah. Uh, but the name actually Bumblebee. The name actually came from my wife. I was. I had a much more uh, very scientific calculator type of name. Okay. My wife helped me. Kim. Okay. There you go. When we get back, uh, we'll discuss the economics of the Bumblebee robotic system on This Week in Startup. Stick with us. Hey, everybody. I want to tell you a little bit about LinkedIn's advertising program. Yes, you can go on LinkedIn and find high quality leads, get website traffic, and build your brand awareness. The first step is talking to the right audience and the right audience is on LinkedIn. Over 500 million professionals engage with content on LinkedIn every day, and your future customers are among them. LinkedIn has marketing tools built in that let you target your customers with precision down to their job title. So if you wanted the VP of sales or the VP of marketing or the CTO or the data scientist, you can look for those specific titles and you can market to them and within specific industries and obviously geographic locations. This lets you create a better message that your customers care about. Maybe your product is bought by people in HR, but sometimes the CEO or COO make the decision. So you could advertise a different message to those three different constituents all on LinkedIn. In fact, four out of five customers on LinkedIn are decision makers at their company. You know this because you're a decision maker and you're on LinkedIn. So you're building relationships that really matter. And here is your call to action. You can redeem a $100 LinkedIn ad credit and launch your first campaign right now, linkedin.com slash This Week in Startups. That URL again, linkedin.com slash This Week in Startups for your $100 free ad credit terms and conditions apply. But it's well worth typing in all those characters, linkedin.com slash This Week in Startups. Okay, let's get back to the news. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startup. I'm here with the founder of Bumblebee Robotics. And we just got a great overview of how the system works. It's pretty magical. Thank you. This hasn't been done before. I kind of feel like I've seen this in the movie Fifth Element. That's right. <laughs> where uh, Bruce Willis puts his gun up in the CLA. Right. And other and movies. The whole shower goes up, yeah. The whole shower goes up. Everything goes up into the ceiling. And I know Murphy beds have existed for a long time. That's right, yeah. But... Drop down ceiling closets and stuff. Does this exist in the world anywhere for residential? You must Not have done some really. research. I, I've done. Uh, I mean, there are elements of it that exist. So there are. You can go to Home Depot today and buy 
what is called the Raycore ceiling storage and install it in your in your garage. Uh, basically, it essentially works on the hoist mechanism. It's one of these ugly cage things you spin with your hand and ah. you can put like these rubber made bins in. And uh, uh, but these exist and in some functions they exist and warehouses use it in in many ways you know they use the like uh, hoist and they use ceiling a, a lot yeah more but not in a residential so no, it not hasn't in existed residential. in residential so tell me about you've raised a couple of million bucks three or four million four now four yeah. million congratulations yeah. um and when did you raise the money how long ago uh it's been i mean we, we did it in two rounds there was a pre-seed and now this got seed. it yeah so how long you've been working on this uh just a year and four months or so got it yeah. so it took you 12 14 months to get the first commercial unit out right it's so, pretty fast. I right. Mean, I mean, we, we did, this is actually the uh, sixth, um, we call it sixth generation of build. Uh, there was the Alpha 1, which was like the crude prototype that, that we built. Alpha 3 is in my house. Uh, that was like the early versions of it. Got it. And then Beta 1 and Beta 3 are shipped. Got it. And so what is the business model for a business like this? Are you going to yeah. buy buildings and be a landlord? Are you going to sell to landlords? Are you going to yeah. sell to consumers? There seems to be, or franchising. I know right. there's things like California Closets, which I believe is a franchising business. That's or right, yeah. Garage organizing companies mm -hmm. where they'll come in and do your garagery, but that right. also is a franchise That's type right. business. That's right. Is this going to be a franchise business or are you going to be Uber or Tesla? How do you look at it? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I look at it more uh, closer to, uh, it's a, it'll be like a robot as a service business. I mean, we're trying a couple different business models. The, the one that we're, seeing immediate traction with uh, with landlords, owner operators, uh, like real estate people, are where we can rent out, uh, lease out these units, and then show the value it creates to them. And then we capture part of the value, uh, and they capture part of the value. So uh, there is more for the dollar per, like more value per square foot, but there is uh, more space for the resident, more volumetric space. So there's mo more personal space, more functionality, uh, and yet, uh, you know, like there's more dollar per square foot that you can get out of it. So your your customers will obviously be the landlords then. That's right, landlords, and owner operators. They will either rent it from you. That's right. Or you won't let them buy it and just pay a fee. Uh, we so that's another. So some for cus some customers outright purchase works, and these are people who are building. Uh, like prefab homes and, you know, you can insert it right into the factory or something like that. Uh, that would be a better model where we can just like a, uh, almost like an elevator sale, right? You sell it and then there's a tiny maintenance that, you know, we take over the full responsibility of the quality, the privacy, liability, everything around the product. And, uh, you know, we... You brought up security and privacy. Those are the two big objections people have to this, I guess? Uh I mean, those are, those, those are potential concerns, and we've kind of architecturally built it so it's not uh, it's not going to be a concern. So what I mean Well, by you hope it's not going to be a concern. You don't know right. yet because it's not in the field. Absolutely, yeah. So when did you rent this unit yet? Yeah, this one's rented out. So when the person came to see it, yeah. was it a friend of yours who you rented it to, or you didn't know them? I didn't know them. So, and you had a number of people come through the system to see it. And you demoed it for them, I assume? Right. I mean, we had the the second person who walked in rented it. Got it. So, yeah. Was there any concern with the first person? Or do, what was the first person's reaction to it? What was the second person's reaction I, to it? So, I mean, th this one, we're working with Star City. Uh, Star City, like, we, they're awesome uh, partners for us. Um, they're like a co-working space. They, yeah, yeah, they're co-living. Okay. Yeah. So, for some, like, the first person who walked in didn't really... Uh, know much about the co-living, so that was kind of like, I think that was the hesitation. Uh, it was like when she was mind blown when she first saw it, and I, I like, she's like, can I snap it? You know, like all, so yeah. there was that reaction, but uh, it didn't convert into uh, the rental, but it was like right behind that was the second one. And did anybody bring up safety or did everybody just assume this is safe? Uh, so safety, Actually, more than the residents, the people who bring up safety are the landlords because they are worried about potential liability. liability. Right. Got it. And, uh, and did we, privacy come up when those people looked at it, or did they not even notice the sensors? Uh, they ask what it is, ah. and we we show them all the like everything that it captures and what is the data going back and forth. Hmm. So we want, and we have a tiny handout when when you come in. We hand out saying, okay, this is this is how a Bumblebee unit works. This is welcome to your Bumblebee powered home, and here's how 
Uh, here's how you interact with it. Here's the privacy. Here's the safety. Got it. Um, and it's connected to the internet or not connected to the internet? It is connected to the internet. Why uh, would it be connected to the internet? Because we do uh, uh, we do inventory management of because now we're hiding all your stuff. Mm. We are able to make it searchable like like Gmail does to your mail, right? So got it. So there's can, cameras up there taking mm -hmm. pictures of your closet or your go box That's or right. your utensils or your nightstand. Exactly. So if you leave your phone in there, yeah. Computer vision is pretty easy for it to tell there's an Apple or a phone exactly. or an Apple phone. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Or whatever you leave in there, right? Absolutely, yeah. So the idea would be if you lose your keys, yeah. you could just ask the assistant, which exactly. box are my keys in or are my keys in a box? That's right. Or I could open up an app like Dropbox and see the last known image you, uh, so or Dropcam. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, what, what it does is uh, as you're putting things in, it does... Uh, it, it's do, doing a burst images, like it's doing huh. like before, after, before, during, and after, so we can okay. tell whether the object went in or went out. Got it. So it's not taking pictures constantly. No. Only on when something comes in or exactly. out of the unit. Only when you check in, check out, and it's only taking the image of the only the image. Got it. And, and it's a look down, so there's nothing. You know. What about the, the bed? Does the bed have an image? No, but, but the bed doesn't. does not have an image. No. <laughs> okay, because the bedroom is a sensitive anything. place. Yeah, that's right. Right, you're not checking anything into your bed. Correct. That's right. um, so, what's the rollout plan? When do you think people will be able to buy this? If somebody wanted to order this today, could they order it from you? From yeah. Bumblebee? So what we're doing now is we're doing beta shipments to like strategic partners, uh, people who have. Uh, the right type of install base for us, right? So uh, we're doing it in various settings, like multifamily, studios, uh, one bedroom, two bedroom, um, uh, co-living, um, uh, like hotels, employee housing, like various types of like classes of customers. And then- How we, do you pick those? Like as a founder of a company, how do you pick who are strategic people? Who do you want to work so, with? So yeah, it, it took- I mean, first of all, I come from product background. I, I didn't know anything about real estate. All, all I kind of knew about was, yeah, this, you know, volumetrically, we're not using space. We should we should package home like we package other products, you know. So that was kind of the uh, epiphany, and I kind of started pulling on the thread and understanding the space. There were, it's kind of an interesting space. Like real estate has been, people are building exactly the more of the same right and when you look at what is causing the houses to be expensive it's not that the wood is getting expensive drywall is getting expensive it's the fact that you're paying for dollar per square foot and everything occupies two-dimensional footprint so there are some like newer classes of real estate folks who are much more willing to you know they're wheelers and dealers they're willing to like try what is what is kind of out there in the market yeah so, well, I mean, people would in a uh, New York studio build a yeah, loft. That's right. Now, you wouldn't consider the loft part of the square footage. That's but right. But sometimes people might get cute about that and say, oh, the square footage also, like if you count the loft area. <laughs> right. But people would build lofts that you could roll around and put a desk under it, put the right. bed above it. And that was how you turned a loft right. into a bedroom yeah. and, a, and an fact, office. Yeah, like loft is a life hack of what like what this can enable, right? So, How defensible is this business? I'm looking at it thinking, well, I've got an investment in Blockable, mm -hmm. uh, which is building modular homes, and I know that they think about 2D space as well. They have cabinets and stuff like that. And I've seen in all these tiny homes, people have desks that lower right. and this kind of thing. How defensible is this? If somebody yeah. wanted to knock it off, could they just build their own pulley system? Yeah, I, I mean, there's a bunch of like hardware things that we've done, which have given us you know, over a year and a half of development. We've made it like how it's like smoother, quieter, faster, like there's a bunch of like improvements we've done. And then on the whole layer of like power electronics and sensor, like sensor integration to address all the corner cases of what the safety could be, you know, if kids are running, if you put a cat on top and kids on the bottom or, so we're kind of wrestling with kind of the edge limits of where, which direction to move when you do that. So when you think of home robots instead of like anthropomorphic robots, we're actually looking at it as a much more functional robots. And we're actually wrestling with these limits of what the robotics are. So we've, we've done a lot of work there. And then on the software side, really there is like a huge edge uh, because there is, uh, there's layers of software services that we can, we can include. Yeah, so the software and the maintenance make it hard uh, and all these edge cases and working that out for safety, all of those things will add right. up to a more defensible product. Right, and the whole user experience, yeah, that's, that. you know, eventually we want it to be kind of 
poetic. You walk in, it does. There's no reason to believe it's a smart home. It just feels like a living whatever. Yeah. And then changes, and it just works around you. So you don't you don't even have to do anything. It's contextually understanding what. Also your great are. for vacuuming. Your yep. vacuuming under the bed will never be yep. easier. All those <laughs> dust bunnies gone. Exactly. Yeah. Now what about the sofa? You're, you're sitting here on a sofa. Right. I'm shocked that you didn't have the sofa drop down. We, is that in the plans to have drop down sofas? Absolutely, yeah. We have, we have How like are you a, gonna do that? You have to make the actual sofa then. And we, you have these like crazy <laughs> ribbons on the corner. It'd be right, weird, right? Right, right, yeah. I, that's why so, so, like couch and like coffee tables, they, they're they kind of part of the home decor almost. Yeah. So we don't expect people to live in like yoga studios, uh, you know, when you walk in. So I think there'll be some floor furniture. I think there'll be some ceiling furniture. Now you can optimize yeah. in like both of those planes. Awesome. All right. Well, this has been amazing. Continued success. Um, and for people who want to buy it, uh, you got to be on the strategic list. So it's not at available yet at yeah. the moment. Yeah. Where can people learn more? Uh, go to bumblebeespaces.com. And, uh, bumblebeespaces.com. That's right. And uh, they can just email you or there's a form there? Yeah, there's a form there. They can email me at sankarshan at bumblebeespaces.com. Uh, or you need to spell Sankarshan. Yeah, it's S A N K A R S H A N. Um, okay, we go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or you can use the form if you can't use remember that, form, or you don't yeah. want to hit re- yeah. rewind three times. <laughs> All right, continued success. I'm ver- I'm super fascinated. I wish you great luck with this. I think this is going to be a godsend for cities where people are trying to create more efficiency and that's right, including lowering costs. Because if you had a two bedroom, oh yeah, a lot of people will get a two bedroom for one person so they can right. have an office. Yeah. And have a bedroom. Right. And here you've put both into one. That's right. This actually could make uh, rents go down. So exactly. you charge yeah. extra. What I, I the opportunity I see is to um, let people save money. So I That's could see right. a two bedroom with this setup. If that yeah. would normally cost four thousand dollars here in the Bay Area for a two bedroom and you were unwilling to share it, now you might actually be willing to share it because your Absolutely. bedroom is a living room slash office. That's right, yeah. You yeah. can do like two bumblebee rooms. They become, like young parents can live in the city in a one-bedroom footprint, but get the full functionality of two bedrooms. That's not happening with young parents. You, they're <laughs> going to need a two-bedroom if you want to have sleep and sanity. But yes, you could have the nursery. Right. You could, yeah. You can yeah. have game room. You can Whatever have, it is. Yeah, whatever it is. Awesome. Yeah, you yeah. got to do the dining room table too. That seems That's like a right. no-brainer. Exactly. Well, yeah. no, but then it would have on the edges of it those bands. So I guess some so, things with the bands. Yeah. I mean, we, we can, there are, in our, uh, uh, in our road map. roadmap, we have the plan to like potentially get rid of it. Huh. Or we, like sometimes we detachable. just detachable, detachable potential. Yeah, so they could slide off the end of the right. table, and the the strips go up and magnetically attach back, and then put them back. back. Or yeah. even if they just slid on with a, some sort of safety. Right. But would you think a magnet could be strong enough to do it? I mean, just like to like to get it into the right place. Oh, to gro- get into the groove. Yeah. Oh, so that would be great. The snap on, snap right. off would be wonderful. Right. All right, listen, this has been amazing, and uh, good luck. Thank you. And yeah. we'll see you all next time. This week starts. Bye bye. Hey everybody, it's Jason Calacanis from This Week in Startups. We're here in San Francisco Bay, and we've got a special treat for you today. Everybody's heard of Teslas and electric cars. Well, today we're going to see uh, one of the first electric boats. How did I meet you, by the way? I cold emailed you. I knew you were into Tesla, you were into electric vehicles. We're building something electric. I thought you'd like it. Uh, yeah, I'm a sucker for a good electric vehicle. This might be my fifth. So. It's about 20 grand to put these in. They last five times longer than the other ones. But you mentioned something to me about the wake of these vehicles. Tell me about the wake produced by an electric motor versus a gas one. When we use this motor, we put it on boats that are efficient. And efficient hulls, ones that get a lot out of for their energy, also produce little wake because wake is the wasted energy. And the interesting thing here is we're on the boat. It's going pretty fast now. It feels like we're at about a third or a fourth of what this boat's yeah. capable of. That's right. We're, we're, we're not nearly full speed in this boat and uh, we, we can talk at a normal volume. We're in a normal boat with a gas motor. We couldn't even talk. No, we can look at each other and yeah. scream and not hear each other. Yeah. Uh, so you spent six years of your life on this and you got to try to figure out how to make this a business and get it to market. What's your plan? Are you going to try to sell these to a specific vertical or do you think you want to run a taxi service that's quiet? Because there are a lot of lakes where people are pissed off about boats. 
Right, there, uh, there are huge markets that this motor can appeal to, but this is all about crawl, walk, run. We've taken six years to build this, because the first three we built a prototype, and the next three we built it reproducible. So we have a motor now we can build at low unit cost, at high volume, and address all of the markets eventually. But first, starting with vertical markets. What would you say the top three markets are in order? So the, the beachhead market is rowing coaches. I used to be a rowing coach, and 90% of those who see the motor say, yes, I'll buy it as soon as you can ship it to me. So there's a few thousand boats that are for rowing coaches. Then after that, we have fishing, where fishing, beyond just the power and the speed to get there, if you're quiet, you catch more fish. And it's a competitive sport. So there's an incentive for somebody who may not just want to go electric. If you want to win, you want the quiet boat. Got it. Now, what about the environment? Because I know that some lakes have days where you can't be out there on a boat, there's pollution, there's a limit to the number of boats. It would seem to me that if you're able to produce these, uh, Lake Tahoe or another lake could just say only electric boats. That's right. A lot of the reason that they can't ban boats in certain lakes is because it would eliminate the culture of boating, which is part of the heritage, like a Tahoe. But at certain places like Lexington Reservoir and Los Gatos near here, and in all of the Baltimore area, they've banned uh, all gas boats already. Uh, and there are areas where they have restrictions against horsepower. This boat can go faster on Lexington, for example, than any other boat that can go on that lake. And in the uh, Baltimore area where they allow only electric, this will go 30 miles an hour where the fastest boats now go 15. So we're sitting here in this 90-year-old boat, risking our lives in the bay with these giant hulking boats. It turns out that these uh, boats that we see here that are the freight ships that come in and out of the port of San Francisco, Long Beach, other ports, are some of the most polluting vehicles on the planet. They're burning a type of oil that is even worse than in these smaller boats. Um, when do you think you would be able to build a system to replace those dirty engines that require massive power? Is that 10, 20, 30 years out? Tell us. Uh, probably closer to 20. But as you note, one large super container ship produces as much sulfur pollution as all of California's cars. One produces as much as California. And the ability to put electric is not there yet. Could they be partially electric, like a hybrid? Maybe getting in and out of the ports could be electric? Because I know they come in by tugboats, but it, what's the issue there? The density of the batteries, the weight of the batteries, the amount of power needed? Uh, it's the long, long distances they go. So they go non-stop, day and night. Uh, you'd have to make them longer, flatter, and smaller scale to be able to go on solar during the day and stored power at night if you wanted to go long distances. Which takes me to the next question I have, which is when we started buying Teslas, you know, six, maybe eight years ago when I got my Roadster, uh, everybody com was fearful of range anxiety. What's the range? What's the range? And then it became not range anxiety, but charging time anxiety. Supercharger solved that whole problem. Do you have a supercharger model in mind for your company? Superchargers are DC quick chargers, and our standard charger we ship to the customer is a DC quick charger. Everybody has a supercharger of their own, but almost all boats, people take off and return to the same place, unlike a car where you go from A to B. So the need for to charge on the road is much lower than for a car. You would have to be going on a multi-port journey to need that. So what is the uh, time to charge one of these boats in order to boat all day long? In other words, if I was going to boat at a nice space here for eight hours in the bay, how long would I need to charge? About two hours. So I could do eight hours, come back, charge for two hours, and then do a night cruise or something if I was a commercial boat. That's right. Yeah, about two hours to charge fully. And how are you going to make a business out of this? Because we saw the uh, massive struggle that Tesla's gone through over the decade. It's been pretty brutal. They seem to be churning a corner now, but it's only gotten harder for them as they make more cars. Uh, what has the reaction been by VCs and investors? Are, are they willing to fund this because they see Tesla doing so well? Or are they looking at Tesla's struggle and that creates headwinds for you? For investors, this is a weird out in left field kind of investment. It's a, it takes a lot of homework for them to get comfortable with it. The factor we have in our favor is we're, Tesla's competing against the Varsity and we're competing against the JV. Innovators, some innovators go into cars. Cars are very well evolved vehicles. It's a modern luxury car is quiet on the inside. It's fine. But car, boats have not evolved since 1970. And we can get someone twice as far on a unit of fossil fuel burned in a power plant as burning that same unit of fuel in a boat. Where Tesla, it's about it parity. 
Okay, the question everybody's gonna have is, hey, can we put solar panels on the hood of this, or if it's a bigger boat, and then be able to ride forever in the zombie apocalypse, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, but we don't see those on Teslas. We saw them on the horrible Fisker car that failed. What are the, your thoughts on solar plus electric boat? Eventually that'll make sense for the slower boats, but the, the amount of power you can generate from solar isn't enough to significantly affect your range now. Maybe it would add one or two percent to the battery a day or something? Uh, probably close to three or four percent in a bright sunny day, but why bother? That's going to be the thing you're maintaining all the time. People step on it, it breaks. And if you put the same solar panels on the dock and feed into the grid when the battery's full, then you get a lot more yield from the same asset. Uh, and where is the company based? In Seattle, Washington, which is the perfect city to base a company like this. How much money has been invested in the company today to get to, I think, where you're at now, which is about to be commercial? Yes, about to be commercial a little bit later this year. It's a little over $5 million. I'd say between one and two of that went into mistakes. So, you know, but about $5 million bucks to date. If only 20 to 40% of your startup funding went to mistakes, you are the most efficient startup founder <laughs> I've ever met. So what did you work at Microsoft? You took down a huge bucket of cash and you invested it in your electric boat startup? Or are these investors, VCs, friends and family? How did you fund the company? So we have a handful of prominent angel investors who invested and I've put the majority of money in myself. I built uh, an internet auction company. Uh, after I left a company called General Magic, a friend of mine started eBay, sounded like a good idea. I ah. started one and I sold it to Interactive Corp uh, 19 months later for $54 million and then I retired and then this was my unretirement. Got it. So you, you basically had, an, you had enough. Hey guys. You had enough money to retire and you decided why do that when I could build a startup right. and you worked at General Magic yeah. working on digital assistance and AI and all this stuff before anybody knew about it. That's a truly pioneering company. It doesn't surprise me that you're doing something as uh, innovative as this now. Yeah. Um, are you going to make your own boats too or does that not make sense because people want to pick their own boat unlike cars where the engine and the car come together in boats. I think it's pretty much the tradition that the engine comes separate, right? That's that's the that's a great question, and to, people sometimes buy the boat buy them together, and they sometimes buy the motor separately. The motor typically lasts about a third as long as the boat, so you have to replace the motor. There has to be a market for each, but uh, hulls are as unevolved as powertrains are. This is not a business that's innovating on either side, and you can imagine that a boat would perform much better if you did the same innovation on the hull as you did for the powertrain. Okay, so that's a way of saying we don't want to announce it right now on your podcast, Jason, but it's definitely on the roadmap or for a deep consideration because I got to think the efficiency of the hull matters. Absolutely. It matters to a huge degree. This 1929 wooden boat that was built in an era where they didn't have power to throw at the problem performs better in, than a modern boat wheel built with modern composite materials to today's designs. This is a more efficient design because it had to be back then. And have you thought about taking an Uber-like approach to the business? In other words, hey, if people aren't ready to buy this, maybe you make a fleet of them yourselves and you run a taxi service uh, or you rent them out to people. And because you know, you go to um, any lake or any uh, beach town, you can rent boats. Maybe that's a better way to get it to market and to get people behind this incredibly innovative, important concept that will save our oceans. Yeah, that's a that's a it's a great model, and we have a we have a whole generation of people who aren't boating. The average boat buyer today is 53 years old. Millennials don't want to own a car, and they definitely don't want to own a boat. A shared ownership model makes sense, but we our our problem now is not demand. Our problem is supply. Getting our stuff built and shipped to customers. When we do demos, and 90% of people say yes, the problem is not that we need to innovate on the ownership model first. The problem is ship product first, and then figure out an ownership model to expand the market. Uh, that makes total sense because I'm 47 yeah. and I just started thinking about and I live in San Francisco and I, this is my first time on the bay today. Thank you for taking <laughs> me out. And uh, I've actually started considering getting a boat, which means that, that I'm exactly on that 53 year yeah. time frame of getting a boat. Um, so are you drafting off of this massive progress that Tesla made with battery packs and management of batteries that they drafted off of mobile phones and, and cellular phones? doing uh, battery events. It seemed to me you could just buy battery packs and not have to be in that business. Uh, to not buy, to, to go outside to buy the component that represents half the cost, weight, and complexity of your system is a big mistake. 
So then you're actually just a packaging company for the battery company, and you're taking their IP, which they've marked up, and then marking it up again and hoping the consumer doesn't care about cost. We build our own battery pack. We draft off Tesla in the sense of use good design, follow the best practices. There have been teardowns of the Tesla battery packs. Learn from them. Follow what they do. Use small cells. Don't have a pack that blows up if there's a problem. So we're definitely piggybacking on their innovation. We innovate where there's an intrinsic reason to be different than Tesla and then do what they do in other areas. Well, this has been incredible. I really appreciate you taking the time. And as I always tell everybody, you can never underestimate any founder. And when I get a cold email and I feel that passion, I felt that passion from you, Andy, that you really cared about what you're doing. And I'm just super delighted. And it's a great reminder to everybody out there that just don't underestimate anybody because you could be the person just through your sheer force of will and putting that couple of million dollars in that changes the world. I really think that we're polluting the oceans to a level that is unconscionable and yeah. beyond you know the 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 delightful user experience of an electric motor being able to talk again on a boat which opens up so many great possibilities we're destroying the ocean yeah. and, and a big part of it is boats correct right. yeah even a recreational boat a friend of mine has a, a mastercraft wakeboarding boat and he occasionally goes out on the weekends i ran the numbers for him and 93 percent of the pollution in his life is driven by his mastercraft not by the car the suv he drives every day because these boats that recreational boats are putting out 10 times the pollution per gallon that a car does wow and for that reason alone i think um we got to get this company funded. We got to get some. There's got to be some brave venture capitalist out there who wants to make time. Have you thought about doing a Kickstarter and you know selling a thousand motors in advance? I haven't seen successful, uh, you know, eighteen thousand dollar Kickstarter campaigns. I've seen successful one thousand dollar ones. Well, you know, you could take a page out of Elon's book and take a thousand orders ahead of time, make the signature one through one thousand. Have you done that? Have you t started taking orders? Yeah, we've taken pre-orders for all of the ones we're going to produce in our first uh, batch of fifty. Oh, fantastic! So you got. 50 times whatever 20,000 a million dollars up front that's right well, wow, we that's all of the money received we have that like tesla the same proportionate deposit got it you got to make those first hundred pay in advance there's always those people out there who want to support your company also i think equity crowdfunding might be an interesting thing for you because non-accredited investors even accredited investors they might really want to see this vision happen in the world because of their passion for the ocean our, our customers are so enthusiastic. This hat I'm wearing was made by one of our customers who made 48 of them and brought them to our office to give to us to inspire us. Absolutely. And we all know Elon is uh, funding the boring company with hats and blow torches. So maybe there's maybe you could do some spear fishing or yeah. uh, stuff like that. But uh, this has been amazing. And uh, if you are thinking about funding your company and you're looking for an angel investor, I'm Jason Calacanis. Email me, Jason at Calacanis.com. Maybe we'll fund your company too. Okay. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. I want to talk to you a little bit about our upcoming event, SCALE. That conference is happening October 10th and 11th here in San Francisco. We have 1,000 tickets available for free to our founder friends. You can go to launchscale.net slash tickets to get one of those free tickets. You apply for it. If you're a venture capitalist or from a big company, please buy a ticket. But we do like to give away those thousand tickets to founders. As you know, we don't make money from our events. We make money from angel investing in companies. And speaking of investing in companies, we have five startup slots available at LaunchScale. And these will be for companies that want to raise money with the Seed Invest platform. And those companies thanks to my friend Ryan from Seed Invest, will be able to present on stage and receive feedback from myself and Ryan and one other investor in a mentoring session. If you want to be one of the five companies and want to go through the Seed Invest platforms program, which I just did with inside.com, and it went very well, and I'm very pleased, go ahead and visit launchscale.net slash crowdfunding. Launchscale.net slash crowdfunding, and you can apply for one of those five startup slots. This is an incredible opportunity to get feedback from great investors, promote your brand, hire talent, and raise money, all the important things that startups need to do. Now, a lot of people have asked me, can I speak at launch scale? Yes, you can. There are two ways to speak at launch scale. One is you apply, and that's on the website at launchscale.net. And when you apply, understand that it's not about you. You're not there to promote yourself. You're there to share knowledge and help other founders grow their companies. That's why the conference is called Scale. The reason our conferences are so good is because we require that people have their decks in two weeks before the event and that they do a rehearsal at least one, sometimes two or three, before we let them on stage. 
because we have these qualifiers, every event we have two or three speakers drop out at the last minute because they don't want to get their homework done. And we replace them with other great speakers. So if you want to apply, go ahead. I don't recommend applying to speak at this unless you're serious about providing massive value. The second way is you can become a partner, and we allow our partners to actually pitch from the stage their product or service uh, for 8, 10, 12 minutes, and that's part of how we pay for the event. It's how we keep the lights on. And I really appreciate anybody who wants to be a partner. If you want to be a partner and you want to pay uh, to buy everybody lunch or dinner, Email me, jason at calacanis.com. I answer my email.